Equipping the Church to Evangelize in the 21st Century. In this series, Minister James Sanderson will be giving a biblical study on the fundamentals of the faith. So as a believer in Jesus, you can be better equipped to win people to Christ and keep them in Christ. Open up your Bible with us as we evangelize in the 21st century. Hello friends, it's so good to be back with you again as we continue our study on evangelism. We are in study number five. This is the five, fifth lesson that we've had. We are in uh, chapter number two of our workbooks, and I hope you've got your workbook with you, Saving Souls in the 21st Century. I really think this is going to be important for you to have a copy of this so you can take this out after this series and then go out and actually use it as a tool to go study with somebody. But uh, before we get started, we've got a friend with us here today, and, and who, who do we have with us? Guillermo Espinosa. All right, Guillermo. Uh, good to have you today. Uh, thanks for coming back. I'm glad I haven't scared you away yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bill's a, Bill's a good friend. Uh, uh, we're, we're just glad to have him today. I'm glad to be here. Yes, thank you. Well, so far we've looked at leading someone to Christ. We've looked at the sin problem. Sin separates you from God. We looked at the uh, sin solution. It's a grace-faith system. Where there's grace, where there's faith on the scene, that's where we can be forgiven of our sins. Then we looked at our third study, and we looked at, or our, yes, the third study, at covenant. And then if you're not in, a, in, a, in an agreement with God, there's nothing that God, there's nothing to bind God to forgive you and give you heaven. So we must be in a covenant relationship with God. And then our fourth study we looked at last time, we looked at how does this Bible work? It's a big chunk of Bible, isn't it? Yeah. And understanding how covenant works and what covenant that we are under. And we see that once in Jesus came, right, the new covenant began. And the day of Pentecost, when he read the conditions of that covenant, uh, if people would accept those conditions, then this is where they enter into covenant relationship with God. Right? And we'll talk about that just a little bit more in our next study. But before we get there, I'm going to look at the study here. It's on page 45. It's Making Disciples, Becoming a Committed Follower of Jesus. Let's look at a Great Commission verse that God gave His apostles here. We've probably read this a lot, um, Bill, in, in Bible study, right, recently? Yeah. What does Matthew 28, 18 through 20 say? And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. See, this is just before Jesus returns back to heaven. He, he, he died, he was buried, he was raised. He spent 40 days on earth with his apostles, talking to them at different times and others. And just before he gets caught back up to heaven, he gives them this, as we call a commission. And that commission is broken down into three parts. Go make disciples of all nations. Once that person becomes a follower or disciple, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, you take that person and you baptize that person, and then you teach them everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the end of the age. Now that's what Christians have been commissioned to go do. All right. So the first step here, on your way to a person on the way to salvation and being into Christ is, is that you have to become a disciple. All right. Now let's make an important point here. Many people equate that if you are a disciple of Jesus, that automatically qualifies you as being a Christian. Being a disciple or follower of Jesus does not necessarily make you a covenant child of God. See, according to these verses right here, a person is not in the family of God until they're baptized. If you look right back here, Bill, and you see these verses, if we go back up to the page here, it says, verse 19, Therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in. You see that word in right there? Yep. 
We're going to use a Greek here, okay? I don't know a whole lot about Greek. I know enough to get be dangerous, okay? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out English, all right? Yeah. But it says here, baptizing them in. The word in here is the word ice and in the Greek, and it means the point reached. So, a person is not in Christ. They're not in the possession of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're not in that family of God until they are baptized. Okay? They haven't reached God yet. Okay, do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So, this shows that uh, a disciple of Jesus is not in the possession of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit until they're baptized. Yet before that can take place, a person must first be made a disciple. The first and most important step in becoming a saved covenant child of God is making the decision to become a disciple of Jesus. And i got to tell you something. Um, it is so wonderful when I have people come to me and say, man, I want to be baptized, right? Their sins are washed away. They're becoming a covenant child of God. We're going to see that in our next study, Bill. But so many times, they just, I never see them again. I'll baptize them this Sunday, and by next Sunday, they're gone. And I hate to see that. And I'm wondering if, is it because we didn't make them disciples first? Okay? So, I want to really get back to this and really tear into this, this section here. So, let's turn the page here and let's ask this question, what is a disciple? This is on page 46. The definition of a disciple from the, from the Greek, and this is the word um, um, mathis, in the Greek is a learner. To learn, indicating thought accompanied by endeavor. In contrast, it denotes a teacher. Thus, a disciple is one who follows one's teachings. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you've got the word follow, then you've got one who's following someone's teachings, a follower. All right? That's yep. what a disciple is. Now, before one can become a follower of Jesus, they must first make a very important decision. Watch these words of Jesus. This is in Luke chapter 14. He's going to talk about some people being a follower, okay? Um, Bill, you want to uh, read uh, verse 25 through 27, please? Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone come to me and doesn't not ha hate his own father and mother and wife, and children and brothers and sisters yes and even his own life he cannot be my disciple whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples hmm well, that's pretty strong yeah. now a lot of people look at this and go, no, wait a minute, Jesus is saying hate here? We have verses all over the Bible where Jesus, God is telling us to love our mothers and fathers, honor our mothers and fathers, love our children, love our wives, right? Yeah. Here he's saying, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to hate them. It's pretty strong, isn't yeah. it? Okay. Now, when people see this, they, they panic sometimes. What is Jesus saying here? If you couple this, and I've got it right here in the bottom of the page, Matthew 10, 37 through 39. Jesus talks about this same subject uh, again, and he says, he says there, he says, you must, love them, you must love me more than father and mother and your own self. Okay? So that's the contrast between these two. And sometimes you've got to put the whole Bible together to really get what it's saying. Right. But the bottom line is this, is Jesus is saying, nobody can come before me. Yep. You want to be my disciple. You want to follow me. You're going to have to make a commitment and decide, are you going to follow me for the rest of your life? That's, that's what Jesus is asking. Yep. Now, he's going to give two examples here. When you look at verse... 28. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? So you're going to build something, right? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, but was not able to finish. I had a, I had a friend up uh, when I was growing up, where we, where we lived uh, up in Rapid City, Michigan. Uh, his 
the parents' house had actually burnt down. There was a spark from the fireplace, and you know, mom and dad lived there. Here's all the kids. Um, some of the kids were older. They were right around graduation age, a little bit older than graduation, but the house burnt down. Everybody was fine, which was good. Well, mom and dad said, you know what? I think we're moving south, going to Florida where they don't have all the snow or something like that. And so they just gave the property to one of their sons. Okay. Well, so one of the sons got some money together and said, man, I'm going to build a house on here. I'm going to rebuild this house. So we got together and he put a basement in. All right. Nice basement. But then what happened is, is he didn't, he ran out of money. So what happens when you have a basement? Well, the rain comes and fills it up and the dirt blows and the Walmart bags blow in, you know, and all this garbage and people would drive by and go, that was kind of foolish, right? I mean, he started a good project, but he didn't have enough to, to finish. And that's the point that Jesus is saying here. I want you to really think this out. If you're going to jump in line and say, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus. Are you in it for the long haul or are you just going to do this for a couple of hours? Right. And Jesus is saying, you better sit down and count the cost first. Then he gives another story here in verse 31. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet those who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the others are yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. One of the things I had earlier here in the study, we didn't go over it, but all sin is selfishness. I think if you took any sin, you're going to see self in it. We want what we want. And Jesus is saying, you going to follow me? It's not about you anymore. That's pretty hard, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I like to be my own boss. I like to, you know, say where I go and what I do. Yeah. But when you come to Christ, it's over, man. And that's, you know, we were talking about baptism earlier. That's, that's what that baptism shows. It's like you're burying that dead body. You're submitting to God and you're bringing up a new one. It's not about me running the show anymore. That guy's, we buried him. He's gone. He's, he's out of the picture now. We bring in a new one, right? Um, this is hard. Yeah. This is difficult to really make this commitment, okay? But let's go over to page 47. But before we jump in line, Jesus wants us to really think about things first. This commitment is not something done for a few weeks. It is something decided for the rest of your life. That is why Jesus gives us the example of the man building a tower. Will he have enough to finish? Will he have enough to complete it? God wants us to know that being a disciple of Jesus is, is something we commit to for the rest of our lives. So I want us to look at... Bill, this is a book of Revelation, and in chapter 2 and chapter 3, he writes to seven individual churches. And he's given them some direction on how they should live and what's going to be happening in the future. Look what he says here to Revelate, uh, one of the churches in chapter 2, verse 10. What does he say right there on page 47? Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So how long do they have to be faithful? Until death. Until death. So I can't be like a part-time Christian or say, you know what, I'm going to do this for 55 years. But that last year, man, I'm going to leave God and go do my own thing, but I'll still be good, right? Yeah. No, until death. So there's no retirement of making this commitment to God. Right. Okay. All right. Look at uh, Revelation 2.26. The one who conquers and who keeps my work until the end, to him I will give you authority over the nations. You gotta conquer, you gotta overcome. And how long? Till the end. Till the end. Revelation three eleven. What does it say here? I am coming soon. Hold fast what you here have, so that no one may seize you your crown. And this is the victor's crown. So hold on to what you have. Don't give up. Don't be wishy-washy. So that's the point 
that God is trying to get us to see here. It's like, you got to make a commitment to me, but you got to make it a lifelong commitment. Okay? All right? I mean, we, we have these things. It's called foxhole religion, you know? The bombs are coming down, and you're in a foxhole. It's like, God, get me out of this, and I'll be a preacher. I'll do this, and I'll do that. Or I'm in jail if you'll just get me out of this. And then all of a sudden, everything gets better, and we forget all about God. God wants us in there for the long haul. Yeah. Okay? All right. Well, let's bring up another subject here. Why follow Jesus? If, if, if I'm going to follow Jesus, why follow him? All of us have followed after someone in our lives. We followed our parents when we were younger. Mom would hold out her hand out uh, before crossing the road and we would grab onto it and follow. Why? Because we knew we would be safe with her. As we got older, we followed after our friends. We formed a trust with them and felt secure being around them. When we fell in love, we followed uh, uh, after our spouses to be because no one made us feel better than inside than the one that we were about to marry. Even dogs will follow their owners because of the security they feel knowing where their food and shelter comes from. No one will follow after anyone without them first having some good reasons. And, and I gotta tell you, when I was living for self and running the show, I'd have my friends come over to the house and they'd come over with a couple cases of beer and I'd follow. Now that wasn't a good reason to follow, but at the point, at that time in my life, they were giving me a good reason to follow. At least that's what I believed. And here's the point, Bill. We're going to have to come up with some better reasons than a couple cases of beer. Uh, we're going to have to weigh this thing out and say, can my friends give me what Jesus can give me? Can my parents give me, if I'm going to follow them, can they give me what Jesus can give me? Uh, can my, if I follow myself and I call the shots, can that give me what Jesus can give me? And that's what we really need to talk about. And I think this is really important, church understanding that we need to do a better job of making disciples getting people giving them good solid solid reasons why would i follow jesus above me and above everybody else so if you turn the page page 48 this is a list that i compiled and this is why i follow jesus okay number one Jesus created you. I mean, you think about that. You know, we think about the hospital and mom giving birth. You know, we came from our parents, right? And, and that holds a special tie uh, to, to our moms and our dads and all that they did and bringing us up. But the bottom line is my mom and dad didn't create me. Jesus created me. Jesus was at creation, right? God's at, at creation. They created me. I'm going to follow a person that created me, that, that holds the power of creation in their hands. My friends don't have that. And even mom and dad, they may have played a part in it, but they didn't ultimately create me. Yeah. Okay? That, that's important for me to understand. Number two in the list, Jesus died in your place. I, I've, I've, I, I like to share the story when we were living up in Frankfort, um, Michigan, uh, the church building where I used to preach at was called the Beulah Church of Christ. And one block behind Beulah was this huge, huge lake. It was called Crystal Lake. It's about nine miles long, about two and a half miles wide, just beautiful lake. Every year, the guys would get out there, would start to crust over with ice, and the snowmobilers would come out, okay? And they wouldn't wait for it to really thaw out or, or to, to freeze really well. And they would take their snowmobiles and they'd be flying along and all of a sudden, bloop. I mean, almost every year you would hear somebody doing that on the news, okay? And you'd go, wow, that was really foolish. 
Well, every once in a while, they'd be close enough to land or they'd have some other friends with them, and one of those friends would dive in and yank them out of the water before they died. And you'd see them on the news that night, and they'd be all happy, and they'd say, oh, wow, this is my best friend, and he saved my life, and, 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 and he, he, he got me out of, of death, and, and, and I'm just his best friend, and we're going to hang out, we're going to go to dinner, and it's just going to be great. Well, even though these guys saved this person's life, Jesus died in a place for us where nobody else can. Remember when we were going over that, that propitiation? Yeah. It's because Jesus is sinless. He has no sin that God will accept his sacrifice in my place for my sins. I can't die for my kids. I would be willing to die for my kids, but God would not allow me to die and take my sacrifice and allow my kids to go to heaven. And here's the reason why. I am contaminated with sin. Okay? And so I can't satisfy God's wrath. There's only one person on this whole, in this whole universe that can satisfy God's wrath against our sins, and that's Jesus because He was perfect, He was sinless, He's that Lamb without blemish. So, if I'm going to make a choice here and say, am I going to follow that guy that pulled me out of the lake, saved my life, or my two friends that, that, that you know, brought me a case of beer? Jesus died in my place. He's the only one in this universe that can satisfy God's wrath against my sins. My friends can't do that. My mom can't do that. You can't do that for me. That's a Jesus that I'm going to follow. He died in my place so I could go to heaven. Nobody else holds that. Okay? Number three. Jesus loves us like no one else. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? Let's set the scene. Here's, here's a scene you've got Jesus, and, and usually, Bill, they would put the crosses in Jerusalem just outside the city gates, and the roads would come in, and all the people and children would walk up and down those roads. And here's Jesus hanging there, and you've got these soldiers gambling for his clothes. That means that Jesus is probably naked. You know how humiliating that would be? On a cross with all these people to see. Okay? That's what's happening at the bottom of the cross. Also, you have these religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, right? Such, they're supposed to be such godly men. And they are hurling insults at Jesus. And they're saying, you know what? If you were the Son of God, you would, and, and you healed all these people, and you did this, and you did that, and raised people from the dead, why can't you save yourself? Not a very good thing to say, is it? Then you would look over and you're going to find this other Roman and he is going to have a spear. And he is going to take the spear and shove it up under Jesus' ribcage in his side in just a few minutes to make sure that Jesus is dead. Not a pretty picture with these people at the bottom of the cross. One other group, or one other group that wasn't there, it was Jesus' best friends. Remember, he hung out with the apostles for three and a half years prior to his death. And here he's looking out in his big, biggest time of need, and where are they at? All the apostles had left him. Now, one came back. That was the apostle John. But the rest of them are gone. Now, this is what you have at the bottom of this cross. And what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm glad I wasn't put in that place because, see, a lot of times, Bill, I love on feelings, love, or emotions. You do me good, I'll do you good back, okay? That's how we are as humans, okay? Jesus didn't love that way. He wasn't, he wasn't loving based on feelings or performance. The performance that these people are giving him is terrible, okay? He is loving them. It's an agape love. It's a decision of the will. And he loves them so much that he will die for them. Nobody loves me like that. I mean, even my parents, I can't say that they have a love that Jesus has for me. They love me very strongly. My dog loves me very much, my wife and, and kids. But they don't love like that. 
That's a Jesus that I'll follow. That's something that my friends, my family, my spouse, they just cannot give me. That puts Jesus in a different level, doesn't it? And we're trying to look for reasons. To, why would I follow Jesus? These are some pretty good reasons, yeah. aren't they? Oh, yeah. When you really, really think good. about it. Yeah. yeah. The next one is Jesus provides all of our needs. Number four, we sometimes think, okay, where does the food come from? Well, it came from the farmer. Or it came from the store down the street. Uh, here in Michigan, we have Myers and, and we have some Kroger stores, right? But that's not where the food came from. The food comes from God, doesn't it? He provides all of our needs. He gives us the air to breathe. He gives us this earth. He allows our hearts to continue to pump. So He provides all of our needs. Not my friends. Not my friends with the two cases of beer. But Jesus provides all of our needs. Jesus promises, number five, never to leave us or forsake us. Everybody in this life fails us from time to time. Even our dogs. That dog that you think it just loves you so much and it's wagging its tail and you, you're right there. Well, every day for it. And that, that dog is there for you. Man, sometimes somebody can walk in the do door, a, a, a total stranger, and they might have some food. And that dog doesn't even know my name. He doesn't even care about yeah. me. Right? <laughs> it failed me, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes our, our parents will, will make promises to us and they, and they won't keep those promises. I've done that as a parent to my children. Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Now, Bill, how are we going to prove that Jesus never left us? See, the Spirit. Exact, exactly. Exactly. And just the things that He gives us every day. If Jesus goes away, all of this goes away. So we know He's still there. Yeah. The problem is that it isn't that He leaves us. It's that we leave Him. Right? Oh, yeah. So Jesus never left us. He's right there for us, right? Yeah. Jesus is holy and righteous, number six. Um, he never compromises. He will never do you wrong. He will always have your best intentions at heart. I don't know anybody that's ever done that totally in my life. Always. Right? Right. But Jesus... He's holy and righteous. He doesn't compromise. He doesn't dabble with sin. He, he won't lie to us. It's impossible for God to lie. He is always faithful. I, I am just so thankful that Jesus is holy and righteous. Right? Yeah. We follow leaders in this world, and then they get caught up in sin, and they lie to us and things like that. Not this leader. Never. Not one time. Makes him different. Jesus, in, in verse uh, number 7 here, it says, Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades. There you are sitting at a funeral, and they're putting your best friend, your mother, your father in the grave, yeah, your wife, um, maybe even a child. There, there is no moment in life that is more hurtful and your head is spinning, and you're, you, you just know that there, you have no control over the situation. And you're looking around, and you're wondering who in the world could get these people out of the grave. Well, it's not my friends with two cases of beer. The Bible says that Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades. How does he hold the keys? Because when he conquered death on the cross, he overcame the penalty of sin. And sin is a con death is a consequence of sin. And he holds the keys. And he says, they're all coming up. Everybody in those graves are coming up. Because Jesus rose from the grave, he says he's bringing everybody else up. My parents do not have the keys. My best friends do not have the keys. The President of the United States doesn't have the keys. But who has the keys? Jesus. Jesus. I'll follow somebody like that. Oh, yeah. Jesus is God. He is the great I Am. He is God. Yeah. That's a later study that we could look at later. But He is God. I'll follow Him. And the last one... Let me just read this for us. I want us to turn over here to John chapter 12. And Bill, I'm going to have you, have you read this here. It's in 
pardon all my scribbling here. <laughs> it's in verse 47, but just, just read what, what Jesus says here. As for the person who hears my word, but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. Right. There is, is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me to wait what to say and how to say it. I know that his commandment leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Wow. Um, I've had a lot of people judge me and tell me I'm wrong yeah. or right or whatever. Jesus says, I didn't come to judge the world, I come to save it, but there is going to be somebody to judge you. And he's going to judge you by my very words. My friends with two cases of beer is not going to stand there in judgment day and judge me. It's not going to matter what they think. Mom and dad's not going to be there. The kindergarten teacher's not going to be there. My dog's not going to be there. I'm going to be judged by these words. And if that's what's going to happen on judgment day, then I need to know these words and follow the one who wrote them. And what was Jesus called? The Word, John 1.1. 1, 1. That is a Jesus that I'm going to follow. That puts him in a place that nobody else on this earth has. So what do you think, Bill? Is that a guy to follow? Oh, yeah. He's the one, huh? Yep. Above everybody. Above everybody. Above everybody. All right. Yep. Let me just read this. If you really think about it, even our very dearest people to our hearts have failed us at one time or another. Our mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, friends, and even our dogs. Yet these are the very people that we follow after in this world. But when we, when we start to consider Jesus in the list above, no one on this earth comes close. No one can both promise and deliver on the things that Jesus can give us. That, this demands a response on our part, a response to follow Jesus above all others. A commitment that is everlasting. Are you ready to be a disciple and follow Jesus? What do you think, Bill? Oh, yeah. And? Yep. I like it. I like it. I think that's why you keep coming back. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good. Good. I need more. So if, if you have taken the first, if so, then you have taken the first step towards salvation. Now, remember, you're not in Christ yet. Making the decision to follow is just the first step. Continue to read the next study and find out from God's Word how one can be saved, how a person becomes a covenant child of God. So you're going to come back next time, Bill? Oh, yeah. All right. Hey, I appreciate you. Got any questions, any thoughts here? No, I just, it's pretty, you laid it out pretty, you know, nice and understandable and that all that, you know, the jargon of the Bible comes out, you know, and right. it's hard to follow if you don't know how to interpret the words and right and you had well make it simple right yeah make yeah. it simple make yeah. it understandable well that's yeah. great all right church well hey that's the first step let's go make some disciples of jesus and give people good solid reasons why they would follow jesus above anybody or including themselves on this earth i hope this study has helped we'll see you next time